Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Joshua Werner. He is the Chief Creative Officer for Source Point Press. Joshua, welcome to Comic Culture. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So Joshua, the title Chief Creative Officer, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that entails. Uh, so here at Source Point Press, it entails a lot. I wear a lot of hats, but basically to kind of sum it up, um, I help guide projects from their initial conception all the way through to the finished product. So that that means working with the creative teams very closely uh, through script phase, through through the art phase, um, choosing a lot of the branding direction for the marketing and the appearance of things. And also that includes um, handling the factories and working with the, the actual finished product as well. And I have a lot of background in, in production in general, uh, which crosses over to our sister company. So we have a, a, a gaming arm as well. Where we make board games, and I also manage all the production of those as well. So it's um it's a lot. It's a it's a kind of a front facing and a behind the scenes job. So this is interesting because uh, you know a lot of times we'll we'll talk with a, a writer or an editor or an artist, but it's it's very rare for me to get to the chance to speak to somebody who's doing a little bit of everything, but is also on the the other side. So I'm imagining it, it's got to be. Uh, challenging to be able to switch from, you know, I'm talking with the writer about the direction that this series should go, and I've got to make sure that the, the art is looking the right way, and then make sure that, you know, the printing uh, is coming out the correct way. So how do you sort of juggle through those, those different responsibilities and, and give everyone the attention that they need? That's probably my biggest struggle, is um, uh, prioritizing. I, I'm constantly switching gears throughout a single day. I'm getting messages on a dozen platforms, um, about uh, putting together review PDFs for websites at the same time that I'm trying to, to help an artist solve like a creative problem on a page or trying to explain to an artist why this color palette isn't going to reproduce well in print. I'm constantly juggling back and forth. And uh, luckily I have, uh, I have two production artists who I work with where I can kind of delegate certain tasks so that I can kind of get back into the nitty gritty of some of the more intense and detailed things. Um, and most of my creators have like a good, healthy fear of being late, so they're eager to please. Because I'm a big part of my job is project management and keeping them on schedule, and that's really difficult. Um, I'm managing uh, a lot of logistics in terms of uh, turnaround time for creation, turnaround time for printing, shipping, delivery, and distribution. So I also work with uh, Diamond Comic distributors really closely, as well as Simon and Schuster. Uh, who are on very, very different schedules for bookstores versus comic book stores, uh, and we're trying to meet the same release date uh, and manage that production when we're getting purchase orders at different times. So it, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of juggling. But I write a lot of lists. I have a notebook that is. Uh, if I lose it, I'll probably the whole company will go under. I've gotten every single little thing written down in this notebook, and you know I just plow through pages every day. But it's um. It's a fun job because it is a creative job, but it's definitely, and it's good that I know the technical side of things because I can help better guide the creative side to make sure that everything's gonna reproduce well, it's gonna reproduce on time, that it's the end product is gonna make somebody happy. And, uh, and luckily I can jump in and tackle any problem along the way if we need it. So for example, if we get stuck and we need somebody to color a few pages, uh, to be able to meet this deadline while the colorist is working on other ones, I can do that. I can jump in and color pages. Sometimes I'll letter an entire book if we don't have a letterer lined up in in you know on our schedule that we need. I can you know I can write as well if we have a, an in-house IP or a, a license and we need somebody to guide something. I can do script writing, and uh, I can jump in and handle covers. I I do a lot of our logos on our books as well. So um, when there's a hole in a, in a missing piece, no matter what the puzzle piece is, I can fill it. Uh, with myself, <laughs> if need be. So it's interesting because you, you mentioned uh, filling in for a colorist or a letterer, and these are uh, sort of the underrated jobs, but all very important to the way the book looks. So, you know, not being a, a letterer full time, do you find it's it's more of a, a fun challenge to take over, you know, having to fill in at the last minute to get that book lettered, or is it something like, oh crap, I've got to do, you know, 22 pages of lettering, and I, I hope it looks as good as the, the guy that normally does it. I think my biggest challenge is, is time. So I, 
I'm capable of, of replicating a look and doing a lot. And I'm, a, I'm a good letterer, but because it's not what I do regularly, I'm slow. So I find myself like I, I can't I can't nail the comic as quickly as a normal letterer can kick it out. But um, at the end, you know, it's a good product. But I, I tend to take longer deliberating on you know placements and style and things like that. I take longer making sound effects than than our normal guys do. Um, luckily, I, I I only have to fill in once in a while. Uh, I do do some cover arts when we need like somebody to do something for a variant cover. I'll jump in when I have time, things like that. I do pinups and stuff. Um, so I get to kind of flex my my own skills uh, along the way, which is how I started off. I started off as a creator, and um, and I still get to kind of scratch that itch from time to time, even though really what I'm doing now is just kind of fathering other people's creative projects and helping them get legs and get out there in the world. You would say that you were a creator as you started your career. Um, and it's got to be, uh, I guess, a challenge uh, to address a creator who you want to do, have them do a, a job a certain way, and maybe you can see something that they're not quite getting right. Uh, and it's got to be sort of very diplomatic on your part, uh, but maybe sometimes you've got to be a little bit firm. So how do you handle it when there's a writer or an artist who's just maybe a little bit off from what you know the book has to look like? This is such an interesting and difficult part of the job. It's very... Uh, creative people are very sensitive people. And um, I feel like at times my job is equal parts bruising their ego and massaging it. Sometimes to get the best results and in a timely manner, I feel like part of my job is being a therapist for creators <laughs> uh, because uh, regular things in their daily lives, including emotional um, you know, issues that they might face, affect their work. It's not like um, a regular tedious job where you can just go up and keep doing data entry all day, no matter how your life is going. No, this is, I mean, everything in their lives affects uh, the quality of their work because um, it's, not, it's, you know, it's a creative job. And if you aren't, aren't feeling it, it's going to show. So I do, I do a lot of talking and a lot of late nights of conversation to be like, I am your friend, but also you have to make this happen, you are obligated, and I'm going to remind you of that along the way, and I'm going to keep you on task, and in, in sometimes that means I have to be the bad guy, uh, but in the end, when the book is out and it's in their hands, they are so grateful and so thankful for the entire process, that every step of the way, even when it got hard and they had to push through it, and that, uh, that hopefully I'm there for them in the way that they need in any given moment, whether that be something that they're thankful for or not at the time. <laughs> um, but it's definitely a unique part of my job. I um, I definitely, I have to kind of get in creators' heads to be able to make sure that they don't just give up on something um, and remind them why they're doing this and how much they love it too and how good it's gonna feel when it's done. And Comics are really difficult. A lot of people don't realize just how much heart and soul gets poured into every single issue. It's, it's interesting because you mentioned that uh, sometimes you'll be speaking to someone late at night. I know that a freelance artist, you know, if they've got a month to do 22 pages, they're probably going to be working some odd hours. They might be staying up all night. Uh, they might be, you know, sitting by the coffee pot or, you know, have a couple of six packs of Red Bull as they're doing their pages. And if they need that, you know, that polite kick in the butt from you at three in the morning, is, is that, you know, part of your day too, is to like kind of match their schedule? Absolutely. My job is definitely a seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I have to kind of just be available for everyone. Uh, a lot of these creators that we work with, they do have day jobs. So that means um, even though I do a Monday through Friday week so that I can be there with the factories and, and, the, and the printers um, during their hours, the creators need me on the weekends because that's when they're diving in the deepest or late at night on any day of the week. Um, so I need to be available for them too. Uh, we also, um, we work with a lot of factories overseas um, and they are on the opposite schedule. So sometimes at two in the morning, it's 2 p.m. at the factory and I'll need to be there to answer questions when something's on the press and about to go to print and they, they have really pressing questions. So I need to keep my notifications on and my volume up on my phone and keep it right close to my head while I sleep so that I can kind of wake up and jump into it at any moment. It's, uh, it's, diff it, it's difficult to have boundaries and figure out when I, when I have a private life or when, when I'm off the clock. It can be hard. I can imagine that it, it's, it's gotta be a struggle because you know, I know uh, from my own experience working in, in television, there are times when you're just working an odd schedule and it's, it's tough on the rest of your life. And, uh, I'm imagining that, you know, you did kind of say that it's, it's tough to kind of juggle everything. 
Um, so when you do find the time to, to relax, how do you let everybody know that, you know, just keep going. The world's not going to end if I'm gone for, you know, an afternoon or something like that. It can be hard. To, if I, I, always, I never want to leave people hanging, so I always give them some sort of response. But uh, as soon as I do, they're like, oh, you're there. And they, they immediately start talking, you know, more. Um, I usually try to keep them at an arm's distance from my phone. So I'll say, like, don't text me first. You know, we have uh, we use Slack. I'll say, you put it in the Slack channel that's appropriate for the subject. I will get to that Slack channel as soon as possible. If I don't respond, you know, you can press again or try me on, I don't know, big, every social media site. I have DMs everywhere. Uh, you can try me at one of those just in case I didn't, I, you know, missed it. But, uh, but then eventually it's going to come to a text message if I'm an hour from responding. And then I'll have to let them know. Be like, you have to wait. Like, it's going to be okay. I will get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, I run. I run at night. So a lot of times I'm, I'm quite literally nowhere near a computer or any of our files or anything. I'll be like, I am currently three miles from home without a vehicle. So you are going to have to wait for at least the time it takes me to physically run all the way back to my house. <laughs> uh, and they get it. You know, they, they're like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's OK. They just don't realize that they're not the only person who does this to me on a daily basis. It's, I'm, it's happening all the time with other creators, too. You mentioned um, diamond dis uh, distributors before. And um, in the pandemic, when the pandemic came in 2020, Diamond had a hard time uh, fulfilling orders to shops because obviously oh, yeah. uh, the whole world was sort of shutting down. So how did you negotiate that difficult water uh, to make sure that you were able to keep the lights on and, and keep the books getting out and, and all of that other stuff when the distributor is having a hard time doing the same? That is such a good question. We, um, a lot happened to last year during that time. Um, we were very concerned for the, for the retailers themselves. And we were also in a unique position, uh, like all publishers. Do we continue? There was a couple months where there was no diamond distribution whatsoever. And the question was, do we continue to put out our monthly schedule and continue to print the books, even if they weren't going to the diamond warehouse and find other ways to get it to the comic book stores? Or do we halt all business and wait without having any idea how long we'd be waiting? There, that unfortunately wasn't an option for us. We really had to keep moving. Even if we didn't know if the sales were gonna come, we had to keep producing the product. We were, we were nervous about the idea of halting all production. So we kept going. Uh, we got mixed reactions from this from the retailers themselves. A lot of them uh, were excited and happy and they were just finding ways to get the product from us so that they still had new books because it was easier to work with us directly than a lot of the other big publishers. They would be just like, I don't have anything to sell my customers this month. I need products. I'm so glad you guys are making it and making it easy for me to get. Uh, and then other retailers were not. Uh, they were not excited about this, and they felt like uh, if they were in an area where their store had to actually close, they felt like they were being left out of the equation and that the comics world was going on without them when they should have waited for them. So what we did was we, uh, we put together packages of over 2,000 graphic novels, and we shipped them to retailers free as a gift, as many retailers as we could. We offered them up, we, uh, we offered them up uh, in multiple like Facebook groups where all the retailers meet and talk. It was a first come first serve thing, and everybody was allowed to have up to two boxes full of graphic novels. And um, we shipped them all out, and we let them sell them, give them away, uh, what we're really trying to do is encourage retailers to try out uh, sales on Facebook Live, um, other avenues of, of you know, encouraging curbside pickup. We're saying, here's some free product that you can show your customers and find a way to get it in their hands. We don't care if you give it away for free. If you sell it, keep the money, whatever we did, whatever you want to do. And simultaneously, we really upped our game on our own web store to try to increase traffic. And we put a, uh, the last bit of money we had into marketing that and making sure people were aware. We, um, we offered up every customer and reminded them consistently through social media to tag a comic book store that you want to support in your order. You're going to put it in your notes. Just tell us the name in the city and we'll do the rest. And a percentage of whatever you purchase on our web store, we will take that money and we will just PayPal it to that store. Regardless of the fact that they didn't sell it to you, we will give them the exact same cut that they normally would if they had bought it wholesale and then sold it to you. That way you have the option to continue to support a shop, even if they're closed 
if they're open, if they're, it doesn't matter what state they're in, you know, uh, if you want to give them part of this purchase, you can get, you know, support us and your shop at the same time. Um, we also, uh, we teamed up with paramedics. Uh, at the time, there were a ton of paramedics that caught COVID because they were going to homes where people were having difficulty breathing uh, everywhere and they were being exposed. So we, um, we shipped boxes and boxes of graphic novels to paramedics who were in the hospital or in quarantine as a, here's something to pass the time. Thank you for being out there and putting your own self at risk to help people through this time. Um, one of our factories, there was, for a brief moment, there was a big mask shortage as well. And one of our factories uh, that we make board games with kindly shipped us cases of N95s. And um, I drove around to uh, a lot of nursing homes that had, uh, that had people who were very much at risk and had a major shortage. They were literally having problems finding masks for themselves while they're around these people. And these are people who don't live there. They go home every day. They're in the world, and then they have to come back to help these people and, uh, and not knowing if they're transmitting something. There were so many question marks in the air about COVID at the time. So we were so grateful that we were able to kind of play a small part in helping as much as we could. You know, there's not a whole lot a comic book publisher can do for the world at a time like that, but we did everything we could, and, and um, we got a lot of goodwill uh, from it. So when the rebound kind of happened, a lot of, sh uh, a lot of shops that weren't previously carrying us, they stepped up and said, you were trying to support me through this. I'm going to start putting your books on the shelves. And, um, and we gained a kind of a bit of a new following too with online sales that have continued uh, through, even though a lot of the stores are open again, it's, it's easier to, to support a shop. We're still getting a, a healthy mix of, of both distribution sales and uh, web store sales. We're, we're very, very lucky that we managed to survive that whole thing and come out even stronger. It's interesting because you're talking about working with, uh, with retailers uh, in a way that I don't think many other publishers are thinking. You are going to the customers and, and saying, because you tagged us, we're going to send money to the, the local comic shop that they uh, normally shop at. And on the one hand, that's, that's an incredibly giving move on, on the part of uh, SourcePoint, but it's also, it's got to be tough too, because you're hurting during this time, and that's, oh, yeah. that's money that you could have used to, you know, make sure that your lights stay on, but you're doing that to, to build that relationship. And it, it's, it's interesting to see that the retailers responded in kind by saying, well, now that, you know, you helped us, we're going to try and help you. So when you're working with that sort of distribution model, um, you know, how do you sort of reach out to the retailers if you have a product that you want them to be excited about? Uh, you know, during sort of a, a more normal, uh, you know, time of business. So we have, um, we have a retailer newsletter where we will send uh, PDFs of the comics that are coming up. And we also just kind of give them some ammo. We're like, here is some stuff that you're not going to see in the previous catalog about these books. And maybe things you didn't know about it. Or this is a new writer, but he came from a background in prose and he's won awards there. You know, things like that that will kind of catch your interest and also help them to sell the books if they decide to carry them. Uh, we try to like, we try to arm them with knowledge and uh, we're all really enthusiastic and excited about our own products. So I think a lot of that kind of rubs off. On top of that, we also give them opportunities for retailer exclusives as much as we possibly can. If there's a book that they, they think could do well and that we're particularly excited about, we will tell them like this, we're giving you a heads up, like out of what's coming out in the next season, this is trending to be the hot title. And because of that, if you wanted to get in on it early, we could start lining up exclusive variant covers that only your store sells. And um, we can try to get, we have just enough time to get some, some big name artists if you're interested in one, and we will try to give you the best possible pricing that you know, we can get to help this. And it's a, it's a give and take because um, obviously our, our print run goes up. We, we, we sell more books because of these variants, but also uh, it gives them something very cool and collectible um, that they do really well with as a product, and that hype helps increase the, the, the regular you know, store sales as people continue to hear about it. And um, those kind of partnerships have been really, really good for us. Um, we try to do, we try to think outside the box too. If there's a particular retailer who's really supportive and they want anything at all, we're always open to talk about it. I get them in touch with uh, creators who are willing to travel or might live in their area to do signings. You know, Facebook shows have become a big thing for comic book stores during COVID. And now that a lot of them are back open again and have regular customers coming in, they, they haven't stopped doing them because they realize that that 
community that they've grown and developed as, is still helping people who can't get to that shop. So that's sticking around. And as they are now well into this, they're looking for new ways to spice it up a little bit. So we will, we will give interviews with retailers who have these little miniature you know, Facebook shows uh, and, and say like, this, their, their book is coming out and I wanted to tell you about it. It's gonna be in our stores on Wednesday. And here's the, you know, the writer or artist themselves to tell you more about it. Uh, and we'll send them gift packages and you know, promo stuff. Uh, all they have to do is hit us up and, and start a you know, dialogue. You are talking about uh, stuff that is really a, a great way to connect with retailers. And how much of that is what you're doing and how much of that is what somebody else is doing and maybe you're just kind of pitching in? Because again, it seems like you've just got so many different things that you're involved with uh, that you, you might not be able to sleep is my concern. <laughs> you're, you're right. Luckily, so uh, I used to do, as far on the comic book side, I used to do pretty much all of that sort of outreach stuff. Uh, oh, well, that's not true. My editor-in-chief did a lot as well. We would kind of both develop those relationships, but I would be the one sending out newsletters and, and PDFs and things like that. We now have uh, some a, a very small marketing department where um, I kind of just uh, give suggestions and sway things and be like, this is what you need to talk about this week. This is what you want to push. This is the new book that's hitting stores or whatever. And um, I provide him with some ammo and some assets, like you know, artwork and uh, blurbs and uh, some quotes from people about this title. And he will write, um, uh, his name's Cam, our main marketing guy. He'll write press releases now and he'll do the actual sending of everything, which is great. And then he'll partner with our, uh, our, our logistics guy, our COO, to help develop programs that create SOPs for, for how to handle and regularly manage all of these different, this different retailer outreach. And then that retailer outreach also extends over into customer outreach too. They're two different worlds, but there's a lot of similar content. So it can get very confusing. And next thing you know, you send out a million press releases to press sites, but you forgot the retailers to let them know what's going on, or you forgot the end customers, you know, newsletter, et cetera. So it takes a team. There's, there's about three of us that are co constantly collaborating. When you have a, an interesting uh, project that you want to promote, that means that you have creators that you are dealing with. And I'm wondering, when you're putting together uh, an idea for a book or, or someone comes to you, are you looking for a, an established creator or are you looking sort of to find that undiscovered gem uh, who you know, has that great new idea uh, and would be a perfect fit? We take all those things into account really heavily when we go through our submissions. Um, we just did a, a meeting recently where we went through 250 submissions and um, really intensively, and we try to get a healthy balance. But a big part of our mission here at SourcePoint is to, to raise up voices that haven't been heard yet and give a platform to talented artists and writers who, who haven't gotten published before. So we're, we are the first time publisher for a, a lot of creators, and um, we tend to help them a little bit more. We get more hands-on with their projects just to make sure that they're prepping their page is right, and that we end up having a very professional finished product. And it's kind of like a learning course for them too. Um, we also, we do a lot of partnerships where we kind of find new talents. For example, Comics Experience is a comic book school that we partnered with for quite a long time to, to give their graduates of certain courses uh, an outlet for publishing. So they'll say, we've got some great new talent. Uh, we've trained them well here at Comics Experience, so they know what they're doing, and they've created cool things in the class, and let's like give them a place, a home. And then from there, uh, that's a percentage of our releases. Another percentage is giving uh, more publishing opportunities to creators who have done well for us in the past and who have created a good following with our readership. Um, we have awesome creators that we, we, don't, we don't want them to go anywhere else. We love them, they become family. So um, they come to us first with all their new ideas and we talk about where we think it would fit in the schedule or if we could do well with it. Uh, if we have to let something go to someone else, we do will say, this is a great book, but you're probably going to do better here with it than you would here. Um, you know, to, and we'll point them in the directions of a, a you know, friend's company or something. But uh, for the most part, we try to keep them around. And then we try to get some established professionals uh, to partner with new people so that a book will have some sort of legs. Maybe one of them has a very big social media following and the other one doesn't. Or one of them has put out you know, award-winning books and the other one doesn't. And by, by getting them to work together, and create something new, it, it just, it really kind of raises the boat for a lot of the indie creators. 
Uh, and that's fun. I love when we get to do that, when we get to kind of pair up some of our favorite people and get them to work together. If the folks watching at home wanted to find out more about SourcePoint, where can they uh, find you on the web? So you can go to SourcePointPress.com where you'll find our, our web store and, and we have news articles there. Things. Uh, uh, we're very active on Twitter uh, at SourcePTPress, uh, Instagram, SourcePointPress, Facebook, SourcePointPress. Um, and I'm usually active myself personally behind the scenes and all those social media. So if you try to find me, you can just find me at one of the source point places. <laughs> you know, I'm probably the person responding on the other end. Yeah, we, we have a lot of really big things happening this year behind the scenes, a lot of big announcements, a lot of cool partnerships. I personally have a new series that I've been writing in secret and it's going to finally get announced soon uh, from a really cool IP. So yeah, come check us out. Well, Joshua, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with me today. Happy to. And I'd like to thank everyone at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.